And I guess uh, maybe we can start with what was the most even split in those questions. Did life on Earth come from space? What do you all think? Tell us, Jason. I don't know why anyone's <laughs> looking at me. I don't know biology. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's the most natural explanation seems to be it formed here. I suppose it could have come from space, but that means it formed in some other planet. So the most parsimonious explanation seems to be it came, uh, that it originated on Earth. But who knows, if we find it elsewhere in the solar system, then we'll have to ask, you know, if it shares biology, which one was the point of Genesis? What do you all think? And let me ask the uh, people who are sort of closest to the, the biology here and uh, thinking about sort of the origin of these chiral molecules. Um, does that suggest to you that it began here on Earth and that, uh, you know, that obviously the cosmic rays were an important uh, factor in your, your model, but um, could you imagine the building blocks coming from space and then getting selected for? I mean, I, I guess that we know that biological molecules have been found in space, so the ingredients, but, but life itself, um, coming from space, is that viable in your opinion? Okay. Make that question that long. <laughs> well, did life on Earth come from space in your opinion? Do you think? Say again? Uh, did life come from space on Earth? No, I think, uh, Can you use the mic? I think really uh, it's a terrestrial phenomenon. Uh, I think it's likely that we might find life on Mars. I'm convinced that the Martian um, environment was conducive to life as we know it here. We invented a new word, by the way, which I'll pass along to you. You're welcome to use it. It's, you've heard of habitability in the habitable zone. Habitability does not take into account the origin of life. A planet can be habitable, but life could not be in there because it needs a certain set of... Uh, so uh, this month in uh, astrobiology, we propose the word urability, U R ability. U R is a combining term meaning original or primitive or first. So uh, we found it useful in our conversations as we talk about an urable planet. Uh, Mars was urable, but it is no longer, at least at the surface, it is now inurable. And so is the Earth, by the way. Uh, life could not begin on the Earth. Darwin said, and I think this is right, uh, advanced microbial life is so good at picking up anything that looks like food that life could not get compete with uh, you know, the advanced forms of life. Also, the oxidizing atmosphere is uh, very tough on the biomolecules that we need to bring life together. So it is true that uh, something like 200 organic molecules are in the space environment. Uh, that's, that's very clear from uh, radio frequency um, uh, observations. Most of them really are not necessarily associated with life. I think it's just glycine has been found uh, out there. Uh, but everything else is pretty reactive. And uh, Lou Alamandola at NASA Ames built a chamber to mimic, simulate the surface of the interplanetary dust particles that are part of uh, the solar system. And he was able to make a layer of mixed ice, carbon monoxide, methanol, and ammonia. He illuminated that with hard UV down in the 190 range or thereabouts. And in a matter of weeks, a lot of organic compounds were produced from that very simple mixture. And I think that's where the organics of the Murchison meteorite came from. These, this is an aggregation of these particles that brought along the organics that have been synthesized. So anyway, it's the longest answer. I hope that some of it answers your question. Okay, great. No, I mean. Yeah, so for the quality part of the question, so, well, as David was saying, you can synthesize molecules from radiation. So you could imagine using uh, polarized radiation, right? To, but this experiment still needs to be done, right? And you ask about uh, polarization in other environments. So this is what I was showing. So on, on Earth at ground level, we are dominated by muons. So if this is really true and there is a link, then we could look in environment where, where the spin polarized cosmic ray are dominating. But uh, yeah. So underground for you know uh, targets without atmospheres, but uh, yeah. 
Anybody else want to weigh in? <laughs> I can. Um, I like the idea that yeah, as, that the all of the required ingredients for life are riding in on asteroids, and then the bombardment of asteroids onto the planetary surface acts as a catalyst for the initiation of life to start. And then there's a concept out there called the Gaia idea, which every entire planet starts with these seeds and, and prospects for life, just whether it can co-evolve with its atmosphere and the rest of the planetary environment to sustain that life for any given period of time. So I think the ingredients are there from space, but I think the life itself is formed and evolves in the planet itself. All right. Okay, um, so we had a, a talk this morning from Jason about um, sort of where do you want to put your money on biosignatures or technosignatures? And I guess uh, we had a pretty even split in the audience in terms of which one is most likely to succeed and sort of a range of answers as to how long that's going to take. Does anyone else want to weigh in on their sort of reasoning on this and why? I think it's an indication that we should have roughly the same amount of money as the astrobiology program right now. <laughs> <laughs> I also find it really interesting that the split was technosignatures signatures from outside the solar system or biosignatures within the solar system. So mm -hmm. the split wasn't just biosignatures or technosignatures, it's also how far away those right. signals are going to be coming from. And maybe this speaks to what Jason was saying earlier about sort of how faint biosignatures are likely to be in comparison to technosignatures and maybe an opinion that technosignatures are relatively rare despite what Jason was telling us this morning. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean. If they're bright, loud, and obvious, you can see them at great distances. And so since we expect biosignatures to be weak, in C2 is obviously, you know, the best. And if we imagine that technosignatures aren't here or, or loud, then you'll detect them far away first. Yeah, I'm very compelled by the very small number of planets that JWST will be able to do any kind of atmospheric analysis of, for example. Uh, and even that is too primitive to really understand if there's life on those planets. Um, Whereas, yeah, some of these megastructure technosignature ideas, as Jason said, are unbounded in terms of our energy budget and, their, and possibly time scale. And so we could observe them on the other side of the galaxy or even in other galaxies with uh, modest resolution that's attainable now. Any other opinions on this? Okay, well, maybe we can take some questions from the audience. And I would like to start by asking for questions from somebody 35 or under. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jiho. I'm one of the Berkeley interns from UVA. Um, I was just wondering, when you're communicating your work to the general public, so people who aren't really familiar with astronomy research, like what are your approaches or your philosophy on like? generating enough enthusiasm about your work to get more public interest versus like making sure people aren't over eager to think that everything is an alien. I can start. Um, so I know one of the, I do a lot with the public and one of the things that I like to cover is it's not hard to get people excited about space. You show them a picture about space and everybody's, ooh, space. And it's very exciting, right? It's, and it's mysterious because we can't go out and explore it, right? And, and so communicating uh, astronomy isn't hard from that perspective because you already usually have a capture audience. The few things that are important is understanding the facts versus what the popular opinion for the fiction is. And so a lot of people have grown up with science fiction, so if you're familiar with science fiction, you can relate the science facts with the fiction that they're commonly understood or see. Like, we don't actually um, observe with radio telescopes using headphones is a very common misconception. And so changing around to make sure you're not listening for radio waves, but seeing radio waves with light that we, our eyes are not sensitive to. So retweaking and kind of rethinking some very simple words in similes can be a huge help in helping the public understand fact from fiction. 
we have to con combat this constantly, right? I mean, every year the super moon thing is going to be up and it's going to be enormous in the sky and people go outside and they don't see something huge in the sky, right? That every year the email hoax goes around and then they're disappointed, um, right? And it's very easy to breed distrust or like disinterest, I think, from that in the same way that like maybe you were interested in meteorology but then you got burned too many times on it being rainy when you thought it'd be sunny and so what do these weathermen know anyways? Um, I think there's a lot of work we have to do about being precise and in, I think there is a, an imperative that we do discuss our work with, with people, with the public, because um, well, not only because much of it is publicly funded but also because conveying this truth and this knowledge and this sense that the universe is understandable and there are experts who understand it um, is, is, part of, is part of the gig and I think we have to do it. Do you want to speak to this sort of in the context of the detection of life specifically as well and the sort of dangers and uh, kind of possible bad outcomes around that? Yeah, I can't imagine there'd be any weird press about that. Um. <laughs> I mean, it's something that, it's been a perennial struggle. I mean, going back to Lowell, you know, seeing the canals on Mars and trying to convey, you know, the degree of uncertainty and ambiguity there are in messy data has something we've always had to deal with. And you see it over and over again with the Allen Hills meteorite that, you know, had what appeared to maybe be nano fossils and with, you know, all of the, the, the SETI false alarms and, you know, even, even things like the WOW signal. Like, how do you convey to the, to the public all of these issues? And it's, it's shared by astrobiology looking for microbes just as it is in SETI. And, um, and, you know, I think we're getting better at it overall. Um, I think, but, it's, it's a hard problem, and it's one that, uh, you know, as scientists, we don't receive any formal training in, in, in this. You know, we kind of make it up, we do what we see other people do. And there's, you know, more of us every year finding new things and making the same mistakes over and over. I've certainly made mistakes there. So, um, it, it's, it's a challenge. The last two years have been a really stark reminder of the capacity to misunderstand science. <laughs> um, maybe willfully. Uh, and I think this is a problem that we will run into. I mean, right, the cultural implications of SETI signals are going to be profound and terrifying to some. And um, <laughs> it's one more reason that we have to make sure that we report the weather accurately and make sure that people have a general trust in science. I don't know. I don't know what else to say other than we have to do it. And it's not just the astronomers, it's the, the chemists and the biologists. And everybody has to do it. Um, if we, there's a great quote that if you, don't, if you don't tell the people about your science, the pseudoscientists will. Yeah, like uh, the metaphor of being a musician as a court, uh, in contrast to being a scientist. Musician has a certain talent if they're going to be a composer, a successful composer, or a successful performer. They love music. They love what it does to their head. And it's a, it's a talent. Not everybody has it, but uh, most people probably can enjoy some sort of music. And I think science is like that. There's a few people, probably virtually everybody in this room, enjoys this questioning, that, this endless curiosity that we have about our place in the universe and how things work. And that's a true pleasure when we discover something new and learn something new, and particularly if it's really new, which uh, if you're in research, it can be really new. You can be the one person out of the 7.8 billion that knows something new. So that, that's the pleasure. And I like to get a, that across to uh, younger people. Those pleasures are there if you have the right mind, the right talent, and uh, just kind of an endless curiosity that lasts all your life. You know, here I am, been through two careers in academics, and I'm here because I'm truly enjoying what I'm learning at this, uh, at this uh, symposium. Great, thanks. Um, Carolyn, you had a question? <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, you touched on this a little bit with the last question, uh, but how are you guys gonna in introduce the world to, hey, we found life? Uh, because, I mean, you know, you might just stand up and say, hey, we found intelligent life, but I don't know, has there been any thought about how we would even announce anything like this uh, to the world? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there, 
there's been a lot of um, thought on this. The, the general group umbrella under which those conversations happen are called the post-detection protocols. And um, uh, there are generally agreed upon post-detection protocols. They were written a while ago. They don't anticipate every form of detection. Um, they also sort of anticipate that it's, you know, what you said, that there's a big high we're here, it's unambiguous, it, you know, it's clear that it's happened. You confirm it and make sure it's not a hoax, and then you tell everybody is essentially the very short version, the Cliff Snow version. Um, but there's another route to life detection that's perhaps more likely, which is the very long road, where something weird is found, it's appreciated it's weird, people argue about whether it's weird, and you know, you go along until people are finally convinced. And that is a story that you can't keep under wraps till you're sure. Because people are gonna ask what you're doing. And so that, that route also needs to be managed. And you know, we might be on it, who knows? Maybe phosphine on Venus is the beginning of that road. Um, or you know, any of the other anomalies that have been out there. And in 50 years, we'll finally accept it or something. So I think it depends on how it happens. But the short version is, again, I as a scientist have zero training in how to do this well. And so it needs to be people, experts in you know, sociology and risk analysis, risk communication and communication and ethics. Chris is looking concerned that you have zero training. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, as an aside, not associated with my question, uh, as someone who had to write about 350 press releases over the course of the Cassini mission, try getting a nuanced result with uh, uncertainty associated with it through the NASA Public Affairs Office. <clears throat> Not an easy thing to do. So anyway, my question goes to Jason uh, about a statement you made that just, I, I don't understand it, it sounds so outlandish, I, can't, I must have missed something. You made it sound like any techno signature could live for hundreds of millions of years. Um, but if it's a techno signature that requires, you know, transmission so that we could detect it, that, that says that has an infinite energy source. That makes no sense. Oh, I mean, the, the power requirements for a transmitter are quite low compared to our primary power source, the sun. So um, as long as you have a power source, you can, you know, power the transmitter, and it's a small fraction. So the sun has billions of years of energy left. And that's close enough to forever for me, for the purposes of my argument. So I you guess. mean running running a transmitter that you could see over, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds, thousands of parsecs on solar energy, essentially. Sure. Yeah, I mean, be, I mean, we run our transmitters that are detectable at a few parsecs on far less than a solar luminosity. So. So sure. that's a few parsecs. What about half the galaxy? Half the galaxy. I mean, it's still far less than a solar luminosity. We're talking 20 orders of magnitude in uh, energy. Okay, There's plenty so there. So that's a techno signature that was put in place as a beacon, basically. That's to, one way to do it. My argument was more general than that, but that's, that's a perfectly fine example of I, what I meant. Sort of has to be that way, doesn't it? No, I mean, we have a variety of radio transmitters that serve a variety of functions, and as long as we are interested in where things in the sky are, and from aircraft to asteroids, we'll be, running, we'll be running radar, for instance. And so it just has to persist. It could be different transmitters across the eras. It could be for different reasons. The, the point is the technology exists. Um, thanks very much. Let's, um, let's turn to some of our participants on Zoom. Um, Jill Tatter uh, is joining us um, remotely. Yeah, I have a question for, for Cherry. Um, I, I was really excited about your, your talks of the instrumentation for the SKA and the uh, NGBLA. Um, in the case of the SKA, SETI is written in as one of the science cases that um, the SKA will pursue. I'm just wondering about what's its status with the NGBLA. I mean, I think it's great that COSMIC is is teaching the VLA how to build a modern digital correlator. Um, but I just wonder about the status of SETI. Is it written in as a science case? Yeah, Jill, you are exactly right. Um, with the SK, I think SETI is part of the Cradle of Life working group, so it is really uh, one of the main focuses. With the NGVLA, um, there isn't a dedicated working group per se, but the NGVLA is also um, at a slightly earlier stage compared to the SK. I think SK has recently broken ground, but NGVLA, it's uh, still a concept. 
Um, but yeah, it is very important to start the discussion as early as possible to make sure the NGVLA um, uh, people is w aware of our needs and that is uh, why we have written this paper recently to talk about what, what we need to, to, to conduct commensal observations with the NGVLA and, and um, yeah, I think we need to keep the discussion going. Thanks. Um, thanks very much. We, I think we also have a Catherine Denning online. Yeah, hi there. It's Catherine Denning. I'm from York University in Canada. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. Great, okay. Well, I had two observations or, or questions. Um, I'll, have the, I'll ask the one for Cherry first. Um, so, I'm an anthropologist, um, so my take on some of this is maybe a little bit different. Um, I'm obviously, I'm very impressed by the technical achievement of um, getting to the point where you're able to essentially eavesdrop on transmissions that are not in fact directed at Earth. It's very impressive. But does it raise any ethical questions for you? Because, for example, on Earth, we would say that it's a very good thing to pick up your own phone, but it's a bad thing to hack your neighbor's nanny cam. So by extension, do you see any difference between these two different scenarios? It, do you, does it raise any new concerns or questions for you? Um, yeah, I haven't thought about it. I don't know if any of the other panel members. I I think we we I mean with the with the NGVLA and the SK, we might be good enough to detect the signal. I don't know if we can um, decipher it to actually you know watch the TV kind of thing. I feel like that a lot of times with the techno signature searches, we're most sensitive to something they're intentionally sending out as a signal. So to me, it feels like they're kind of knocking on the door, so to speak, to, to communicate or to probe to see if somebody else is even home first. Uh, or their regular communication. So I guess it would be you know, looking at a global network of, of just to see if there's activity um, existing and not any specifics or details. Yeah, but I think this question is about the leakage signal that we're talking about. Okay, now then thinking about it, if it is like just broadcasting everywhere, then they are not, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one communication. So I suppose they don't mind too much if we heard it. Somebody set up a Twitter account for the Wetty Institute waiting for extraterrestrial intelligence, so maybe, maybe that's a good approach. Um, did anyone else want to answer, or shall we move to uh, Richard, De um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Nicholas Richard's question. Uh, Catherine, you mean, or? Okay. Um, uh, hi, so I'm um, uh, Nick Richard, um, and I I'm just like a, uh, a, a, a citizen scientist, more or less interested um, in, 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 in large scale uh, distributed uh, signal processing. That's my academic and uh, professional background. Um, Chris um, mentioned when, 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 when the hosts were speaking before the panelists about um, specific interest in citizen science and open data, and I'm wondering in particular about what sorts of challenges um, the, the panelists and, and he foresee um, in making that um, something that's more viable on a larger scale. Um, Chris? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think it's a, uh, Breakthrough's been instrumental in making a lot of data that's relevant to SETI public, which is really exciting. And mm -hmm. as we heard from James, you know, the, the Rubin Observatory is going to do its best to try and make stuff open as well. So this is an important question. Um, I'll pick one challenge, which is that um, as the number of people engaging with the data grows, the number of people required to support them goes up too. And in particular, I think around SETI data, if the intent of putting petabytes of data online is for people to help look for signals, I think we need a better answer as to what we're going to say to people who think they've found them. Now, most of those will be RFI, or most of those won't be real, or most of those will be mistakes in the analysis. But we need to, if we want a community to engage with that, we better have an answer for the person who emails and says, look, I did what you asked me to do. Um, what's this? 
And I think that piece of it hasn't been set up yet. It's something we do with Zooniverse and our Planet Hunters project and so on. But um, it's a great question. Th thanks, Steve, for letting me hijack the panel from over here. <laughs> I mean, the other extreme of this is um, SETI at home, right? right. Which um, didn't require a lot of eyeball time, but did, you know, make pleasant use of everyone else's computer. And, and that was arguably one of the first large-scale citizen science or um, public engagement of science in this topic. So there's a good model there. That was just using the you know, computational power of your computer. And I don't know what the plan ever was. People did see things in the screensaver and right. post them online. And uh, uh, you know, Matt Lebowski was one of the ones uh, patrolling the forums and uh, you know, kind of responding to people's inquiries. But uh, you know, I think Chris's point is a good one that we need to kind of prepare for uh, prepare for success, whether it comes from the team or from somebody else online. But I have to also uh, say, and I mentioned this in my talk, uh, Boyajian Star was detected from uh, a Zooniverse-like project. Um, of we had the data in the can for quite a while, and all of us professionals dismissed the star as being uninteresting because it didn't fit anything we were searching for. And it was only through the power of regular people, as it were, um, raising it and then, um, and then Tabitha Boyage and carrying it forward and bring it to all of our attention. That, um, so, I mean, we have, a, we have a good model for this actually turning up fascinating objects. Perhaps we can tie back into some of the talks yesterday, uh, you know, these solar sails, sun grazing missions and this kind of stuff, um, back into the talks of, of David and Naomi uh, on, on life detection. Anyone um, want to weigh in on sort of the feasibility of applying some of the techniques for, for biosignature detection on those missions? Can I ask a question? <laughs> I, I wanted to know if, if any of the comet return material had been run through these nanopores yet. If any of the material from the, let's say, the comet return missions, the sort of sample return missions, have been run through. Yeah, we have. The question is, has any cometary organics been put through the nanopore? Uh, actually, I wouldn't expect them to get through because this, the nanopore, are two nanometer mm -hmm. diameter, and these particles that come out uh, are much larger than that. But if there is uh, nucleic acid there, I think we'd see it. For, for the chirality part of it, I, I showed that uh, in meteorites you have actually excesses. But uh, from the samples that came back from an asteroid, uh, we actually are now analyzing it. I mean, not I, but you know, the. the the Japanese group now, and uh, and maybe I think NASA got some. So from the ones that came back in in December 2020, and then there is another one, as I said, that will come back. So uh, hold your breath, maybe. But this would be interesting because if we detect not even homochirality or you know like, but even an imbalance, maybe that could tell us something uh, on which kind of environment are necessary for life to start. So. So I have a very specific question about chirality. One of the things you could do with a little sailcraft is hit an object at, say, 20, 30 kilometers a second, which would cause a plume to come up that you could then sample with another laser sail or another uh, sail, solar sailcraft that just happened to fly you know, through the plume or you, you target through the plume. Would chirality survive that? I think it's likely that DNA might be broken into pieces, but could you say, these pieces are still chiral or not. They're all left-handed, say, or whatever. Um. If, you, if the sugars are remaining, then you can look at uh, the excess in uh, left-handed form of sugar over the right-handed one. So yeah, that could tell you something, yeah? Potentially say this is life-like. The material here looks like it has a biological origin. Well, it's, it's, if you get 1% of excess, you can say maybe, you know, something happened, it's by chance, but if you get like 80% of excess, if, it, if it's not living, it will be hard to come with a scenario when you actually, you know, uh, uh, could get to this amplification. It, it would require maybe some specific conditions, and maybe these conditions are the same that, you know, you need for life to start. So, so the more excess you have, the more likely it's linked to biology. That way. Question over here. Yeah, this is a, it's more of a general question, though I guess it'll tend towards the biology side of things. So the poll we took, I guess there was a bit of consensus that 
um, the first life we detect might very well be a biosignature within our own solar system. And so in that regard, I mean, when we search for biosignatures, we're probably searching for familiarity, right? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, all that. Um, and I guess that is the best option, right? Because out of our sample size of one, that's what we see here. But then, I guess, because our sample size is one, uh, to what extent should we, should we be concerned or maybe expecting biosignatures that we aren't familiar with? I mean, is there any chance that the chemistry that underlies the biosignatures that we'd see elsewhere is radically different than Earth chemistry? Or can we expect something like Earth chemistry in that the, the chemistry that underlies our biology is typical, whatever that might mean for a sample size of one? Well, lives operate out of equilibrium, so even if maybe it's not the same chemistry or chemical reaction, if you detect some, you know, environment where you see uh, reactions that happen out of equilibrium, then you can, you know, focus on this because it might be interesting to know why. And maybe, you know, but yeah, we are looking for life as we know it. I, mean, it's, uh... I, think, I think there's I... a lot of work in them biosignature community and parallel work by different names in the technosignature community to think about agnostic biosignatures that aren't dependent on so many assumptions. I think chirality is a fantastic example of something that life as we know it has for good reasons, but isn't dependent on DNA specifically and the specific chemistry that we have on Earth. So it's a constant struggle to look for life as we don't know it without making the question so ill-defined we don't know what to look for at all. Um, my question puts a point on the previous question, and it goes to David Diemer um, about your nanopore detector. Um, as you know, Steve Benner has been pushing this idea that any molecule that carries ge genetic code has to be a polyelectrolyte or has to be a poly ion. So is your nanopore instrument designed to work only with our DNA, or would it be able to detect any molecule that has that same structure, but has got different, you know, um, side molecules? Uh, yes. If we have what is called a basic nucleic acid, which is just the sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, with no bases attached, that will show up as it gets into the nanopore as a blockade, but it'll be about half the magnitude of the full strand of DNA because it simply it's, it takes up more less volume in the pore. So we would see any polyanion or even a polycation. We can watch polylysine, which is positively charged. That will be picked up. We have to reverse the voltage though to get it to pull into the pore. We can see polyglutamate, which is negatively charged, and that'll go through. But these polyamino acids are produce much less of a blockade because they simply don't have the bulk that a nucleic acid does with all of its bases. Now, maybe what you're asking also is whether we could sequence a uh, extraterrestrial DNA. And I wouldn't bet on it because we use specific enzymes in the nanopore. I'm sorry? You would or would not bet on it. I think you said you would not bet on it. Is that right? I see. Did you say you would not bet on it? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I would not bet that we would be able to see it. Because the enzymes are used to control the rate at which the molecule goes through the pore. So that enzyme is specialized for a terrestrial nucleic acid. So I, so it might work, but probably not, is my guess. So, um, uh, David uh, Messerschmidt has been waiting very patiently online. Um, David, are you uh, ready with a question? Yes, I'm here. Um, I had a question for the whole panel regarding SETI. Um, in particular, do you think that we have the right balance between radio and optical at present and in the future? And related question is whether we're over constrained by our atmosphere and should consider expanding our search uh, in complementary wavelengths uh, in space. Thank you. Well, I'll start by saying 
I think the community is well tooled in terms of radio versus optical. I think we have a lot of the right balance and resources. I don't think we're doing enough SETI work at those other wavelengths. So that's certainly something that I'm pushing for. Um, and then to your second question about um, is it worth going into outer space? Um, maybe. Uh, you know, outer space is a difficult environment and it's an expensive environment, but it does also allow, beyond other wavelengths, it also allows um, uh, un uh, unblocked view, right? You, we, could, we could study the entire sky constantly, and I think that's, that's an interesting challenge for the next generation of studying where everything is constantly without having the pesky sun coming up and blocking our view for half the day. I feel like we haven't explored enough of our understanding of how everything is working and our techniques to warrant the additional uh, complexity of putting everything into space. So I think right now, I think exploring stuff where we can do from ground-based telescopes, uh, we're still learning at a significant pace at the moment. And until we can um, get closer to exhausting what we can do with the technology we've already got available to us and potentially the software that's available to us, then I think the adding the, the extra complexity of trying to then translate all of these experiments um, to, to other locations uh, is an additional challenge. I don't think we need to, to add to the mix at the moment from my perspective. Um, I think there's a lot, I mean, in the 19, 1959 to 1964, there was just a flurry of ideas about how to detect life elsewhere in the universe. And radio matured first. And a lot of work went into it. And we see that today in the success of Breakthrough Listen, that most of its work is in the radio with a variety of techniques. And that came from you know decades of investment into how that should work. Closely behind that is pulsed optical, which also has had work, but not to the same degree. The other ideas, and including ideas, you know, looking beyond radio and optical, maybe high energy, maybe neutrinos and gravitational waves, who knows? Those are much less mature. And, you know, if you gave me a bunch of money to study those, to do those right now, I wouldn't know what to do because I don't have those decades of work uh, behind it. And so I, I don't think the balance is optimal. I think there are probably ideas that once they matured would seem quite attractive and we would do a lot of work with. Um, and so I'm for broadening what we do in SETI, um, but I think it makes sense given the work that's been done where the current balance of effort is for actual searching. Perhaps I can sort of follow up on this question. Do you think uh, the first evidence for life in the universe will come from an experiment designed to find it or do you think it will come from some other uh, survey? If I had to bet, I would say that the, hey, who ordered that? will come out of left field, and then the definitive proof will be the person who says maybe aliens follows up and shows it is. I like that answer. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my question's for Cherry. Um, I was wondering, with the NGVLA, when you're kind of piggybacking off of someone else's signal looking for it, would you be picking this up off of another observation that you're already looking at, or would you be specifically looking for these um, kind of signals? And would it appear any different than a techno signature we would expect from, like, let's say, a beacon or something pointing straight at us? Like, would it look different? And how would you follow up on something like that? Because if it's, let's say, someone's watching their television from another uh, planet, would it be consistent? Would it be just a pulse of, like, radio waves or something? How would you know, and how would you see it? Yeah, um, so uh, as you can gather from my talk, I think we need to, uh, well, so I think the way to go is to look for a, a wide field, um, many, many stars. I think we haven't looked hard enough. That would have been my answer. So I think the optimal strategy with the NGVLA uh, should be in commensal observation once again, because that gets us uh, the m most uh, on-sky time. So we would be looking wherever uh, whoever is looking and try to make good use of those data. Um, and then your second, the second part of your question, uh, how to verify the signal. Yeah, that's, that's always a very tricky thing. Um, I'm, I 
so currently with Meerkat and um, the VLA, it's, it's also a commensal, right? So the, the, I think the idea here is that um, Breakthrough Listen has access to still to Green Bank and parks and one north, one south hemisphere. So what we can do is use Meerkat and the VLA as a survey, as the detection instrument, and then use parks and the GBT to follow up. And we, I think the only way to confirm is that we see it again. Um, I think we will have to do that with the NGVL as well. Use another instrument, we try to detect it again. Would, would you be able to tell where it's coming from? And if so, could you like, almost see a radiating, um, radiating signatures? Like let's say you can pinpoint this location using this method. Would you be able to look at this target and see that it's emitting signals in many directions then? Or would you only be able to see in that one direction or towards us? Yeah, I think from our data, we'll be able to roughly tell where it comes from. As I shown the phase delay, it is specific to each position on the sky. So from whichever one you, did, whichever set of phase delay that you detected the signal, this is how you backward infer where it came from. But I think you might be asking if we can tell if the beam is focused only on us or going in other directions. Yeah. And no, we can only tell if it's coming directly towards us for the most part. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're out of time here, but I want to uh, thank all of our speakers and panelists again. And I believe um, Dr. Warden has some closing remarks. I want to go back to the idea of putting something in space. And the reason that that might be a bad idea is then, then you see the Earth, right? And you have this huge um, RFI source. So the one point that doesn't have the Earth in its sky is the far side of the moon. And, but what we're gonna do is orbit around the moon exactly over that point, something called gateway that we're trying to build. So we are again, you know, messing up our own nest. <laughs> Thanks uh, again to all of the panel. Um, can we get a round of applause for our speakers from session three?